Well, biotechnology has seen revolutionary growth over the past few years, and one company at the forefront of that change is Moderna. You know that name, and that played, of course, a pivotal role in combating the pandemic. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by Nuba Afian, who's founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering and the co-founder of Moderna. It's good to see you. Thank you very much for being here in the studio with us. Thanks for having me. Well, I'd first like you to reflect on the five years since the pandemic. Do you still revel in the fact that Moderna was a big part of saving lives? And what have you learned from that period specifically about the direction that biotech has to go to? Well, I wouldn't say revel in the fact. Certainly, we, we remember the effort that the team put in to try to accomplish the mission of developing a vaccine from scratch in less than nine months and make it available to a billion people planet on, uh, across the planet. And that had a profound impact on people's lives, people's security, as well as the economy in general around the world. And so I think that was an important uh, experience for the biotech industry as to how quickly we can deploy modern technology and knowledge to be able to combat disease. And so I think we learned that uh, by partnering governments, private sector, regulators, we can actually get a lot done. And of course, afterwards now, we wonder how many other places should we be doing this so that we can actually get the benefit to patients. What have you learned about gaining public trust? You know, public trust, especially in the days of social media, is you know, highly manipulable, unfortunately. And often as scientists, we kind of think that people are going to just rely on the science, but that's not the case. You need to make it approachable. You need to be able to explain to people the risks, the benefits of an intervention. And, you know, during the pandemic, it wasn't very hard because people were embattled and people were losing relatives and friends. And now that the pandemic pressure is off, it seems that everybody kind of becomes an expert and opines on whether something is and isn't useful as a public health tool. I generally believe that public health experts have the interest of the population in mind. Governments are trying to protect their population. And I think we need to listen to the consensus views that are out there as opposed to individual views that might cast dispersions and doubts around technology. Generally, that hurts other people, usually doesn't hurt themselves, and we need to be very careful. All right. So you, as scientists, do your own thing, but at the same time, a lot of partnerships from what I get. Um, you said two years ago in 2023 that the world is not prepared for another pandemic. And in this time, the AI door has blown open exponentially, mm -hmm. right? And you yourself believe that it is a game changer in healthcare. So can you still say that the world is not ready for another pandemic? I think the world is not ready from a governance, cooperation, partnership format. And of course, we would hope that if we're hit by a pandemic, people would adopt the same type of open attitude that they had. But we can't be sure about that because having just gone through a pandemic, I think there were many wrong lessons drawn as right lessons drawn. But certainly AI and the various other tools that we're developing are conspiring to give us more knowledge, more access to points of intervention and ways to go after disease, even more than we did before the pandemic. So for example, one of the things you'd like to know in a viral pandemic is where's the virus headed? Instead of trying to get your immune system to intercept the virus that exists, you'd like to intercept the virus two, three generations later so you can actually trap it and get rid of it. We never could do that in the last pandemic. I think we have the tools now with AI to be able to do that. We're working on that in my firm, Flagship Pioneering. So there are many approaches like that. Certainly the supply chain didn't exist before. We now have supply chains. So we're going to need the, the, the societal commitment and the government commitment to act quickly. I think the technologies exist and they've gotten even better. So on the one hand, we're ready. On the other hand, I don't think we're mentally and organizationally ready as a society. Can I just say, we also don't want another pandemic. Uh, yes, but it's not up to us. And so, as you may know from the news now and your reporting, uh, H5N1 is a serious threat. It's uh, basically ravaging uh, uh, certainly a lot of you know, uh, 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 various kinds of uh, um, animals kind of in, in different agriculture uses, wiping out, you know, chicken, you know, certainly a lot of dairy products are being infected. And we're, we're watching carefully its potential transmissibility to humans. A number of humans have contracted it. We haven't yet seen a lot of human to human transmission. But, you know, it, it doesn't, like a pandemic doesn't slowly take its time. 
it comes upon in a big way and we just have to be prepared. And I'm glad to see that governments around the world are taking steps to, to at least be on high alert for that. Well, that said, do you have something in the pipeline to help combat that particular flu virus if it had to you know, go yes. very quickly? Well, we both have the technology, certainly at Moderna, we showed it to the world and, and, and we continue to work to develop new vaccines. And we have it in particular for H5N1. We are, and it's been publicly stated, collaborating with the U.S. government through a BARDA grant to do a very substantial amount of work. We have clinical trials in humans to prepare for that. And if the need arose, we could turn on the supply chains and be ready to manufacture quite substantial quantities of a new vaccine. Our technology lends itself to that type of rapid response. It's computer-based, it's code-based, so that's a really big advantage. Okay, what if the next pandemic is not viral, right? What if it's bioengineered? What if it's AI-driven as a synthetic sort of disease? Um, could we be vulnerable to such risks? You know, it's hard for me as a scientist to say we cannot be vulnerable because we don't know what we don't know. But based on what we do know, uh, I think that a virus or some other engineered biological system, provided we can give the information about that system to our immune system, we can mount a response. I mean, in a way, people don't realize that the real hero in the vaccine uh, effect on the pandemic was our immune systems. And that's, we know that because the people who had weak immune systems, they didn't get quite the benefit. Our immune system is the hero. Given any information about the target, just like any military, it can go and extinguish the target. So our job is to get the information to our immune system in the most safe and efficacious and quick way. And I think for many threats, if not all, I can never say all, um, we will be prepared to be able to counteract it and because our immune system is ready to do that. And another big hero, which I know you believe in, and it's pretty underrated, it's, it's nature, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you wrote about it in your poly intelligence letter at the start of the year. You say it's had a massive head start in healing. How do we even begin to understand the potential of nature and how do mm -hmm. we unlock it? So it's a great question. You know, much longer than computers have been around, humans have been trying to understand biology with our brains and our tools. And, and so now we're beginning to crack open information about what is underlying cancer, what's underlying various diseases. But now we have a new tool, some say toy, in AI, and we call this artificial intelligence, and we're obsessing around how human intelligence and artificial intelligence interact. But the reality is we live in nature, and nature has its own intelligence, distinct from human, distinct from machine. And, and, the, the, and the letter that I wrote is on poly intelligence. It recognizes the notion that we have actually three forms of intelligence, and we need to think about nature as a form of intelligence and study it as such, so that as we look at the DNA information and how cells adapt and evolve, we can actually codify that intelligence. And I think machines will be very helpful in that, and probably more helpful than humans have been so far, because our brains aren't used to dealing with thousands of concepts at once with the way nature deals with these things. So I'm actually quite looking forward to where machine learning, machine intelligence, human and nature start learning from each other. One of the things we expect nature to do is to adapt to the challenges of climate change, to adapt to the challenges of disease. And that adaptation is going to be helpful as we start learning how it's doing that so we can harness it. All right, final question for you. Now, the Trump administration, they want to remove barriers to AI innovation in healthcare. That should help you, shouldn't it? Much like the CDC helped mRNA vaccines and the popularity of that during COVID. How key is political leadership in the United States to the success of your startups under flagship? Well, it's very important. And what's really important is consistency and the removal of uncertainty. And we're living in a time when there's increased uncertainty about what will and won't be favored. And I think certainty is a key ingredient even for startups, not just for mature companies, because you have to, as an innovator, bet on the fact that what you do will be rewarded so that the regulations won't change, the incentives won't change. And so we're paying a lot of attention to it. But I think in general, the use of AI to augment what humans can do and to do things humans cannot do altogether in service of human health, planetary health, we're entering this era. It's going to create a lot of impact, a lot of economic value. And I think this, you know, there's a group of people who worry about what will happen with humans and are we going to have agency. I think humans will be driving this change and already are. Dr. Arfian, thank you very much for being with us and, and keep working for the betterment of society. Thanks for having nice me. Nice to meet you, Dr. Nubar Afian, who is co-founder of Moderna and CEO of Flagship Pioneering.